Hi, my name is Chelsea Gomez. I am 32 years old and I am from Florida. I am married to my husband who I've been with for 19 years, if you can believe it. And we have a seven-year-old daughter named Luna. And my uh, full-time job is I own my own business and it's a non-traditional cancer type brand uh, where we use humor to cope with cancer rather than uh, crying. <laughs> we cry sometimes, but not all the time. So I was first diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was 28. It was in the latter part of the year. I had gotten a promotion, I think it was maybe March, and it really took over my life, this new position that I had, and I was working a lot. So I was very tired, <laughs> but I thought, hey, it's because I'm working a lot, just like any other young person. And I also started getting itchy legs and itchy feet to the point where I would scratch, you know, my feet so much that they would bleed. That's how itchy they were. And I went to the dermatologist. They said it was nothing. Here's a cream. Um, I started also basically getting vertigo and not being able to pay attention. And I almost crashed my car one time. So that's why I went to another doctor and said, you know, I don't know what's happening. Am I just very stressed? You know, what's happening? And they ended up telling me that uh, basically that it was stress and that they should put me on some, you know, attention medicine and that should be fine. And it's because I have a high stress job. And so I said, okay. And the only thing that really prompted me to look any further after I went to these several doctors that said, everything's good, uh, was I got a swollen lymph node on the base of my neck and I had never felt anything like that and it wasn't going away. So I ended up going to the urgent care for them to look at it and they told me it was okay, but then they really, the doctor kind of looked in my eyes and was like, you need to, you should follow up on this just, just so you know, like, I feel like they were indirectly giving me a message. And for some reason, when we sat in the parking lot of the center care, I always remember this, but I looked at my husband and I, I like had tears in my eyes and I said, I just feel like this isn't, a, this isn't right. Like, I feel that there's something more that's going on. And I said, I don't want to say like the C word, but I feel, and he, he's a very like eternal optimist. <laughs> so, and I'm like an eternal pessimist. <laughs> So he's like, so when the lymph node didn't go away, I was keen to just ignore it because I was very busy <laughs> working, but my family was like, no, you're not doing this. And so they said, we'll watch your daughter, you and your husband go to the ER. I went to the ER basically to appease them. And I was skipped over like all the people waiting in the ER. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, what is this? Because you know, that never happens. They brought me back and there was a doctor and she said, uh, you know, we're just going to do a chest x-ray. You're probably going to be out of here in five minutes, but let's just do it just to be sure. And they did it. And she walked in the door. She was holding a stuffed animal, like a bear, handed it to me. And I saw tears in her eyes. And she said, I'm really sorry, but there's tumors all over your chest and we're going to need to admit you. And so I went from being this very young, active, working person, mom, wife, everything, to suddenly whoa, what is happening? And I remember another doctor just walked by and was like, yeah, it's probably lymphoma. Good luck. And I was like, what? What is happening? It, it was quite the ordeal. And I, oh, also another thing that I uh, experienced around that time was I was losing weight, which I was on Weight Watchers. So I thought, oh, it's finally starting to work. Great. But when I look back at pictures of myself, so in fact, I have this picture of myself where I... Um, and in the first ever like PET scan I've ever been in to like have my like before I go in, I took a picture in the chair and then I took a picture of myself like three months later after I had been on chemo and I realized just how ill I had looked and I didn't realize it at the time because I wore makeup, you know, we all do. I had these big dark circles. I just didn't look well and I could see that basically I was kind of like wasting away and I didn't realize it because I was just so focused on working. Well, I got truly lucky in the ER because the doctor that was working was a younger doctor and she ended up telling me, which made sense why she had tears. It was because her friend in high school had lymphoma. So she knew some symptoms of it. So when she saw like my age and just kind of going over and I had some shortness of breath, but again, I had asthma. So anxiety you know all those things so she ended up where another doctor may have just like let me go 
she ended up pushing them to do the chest x-ray just to make sure. And so, um, but I literally went from never being hospitalized other than having my daughter. Uh, I was hospitalized. I had to get my first ever surgery. So it was a whirlwind. I had a surgery within 48 hours and, you know, now I have a huge scar on my neck. I was crying because I told my husband, I don't want to lose my hair, you know, just screaming. At that point, it wasn't 100% I had cancer, but it wasn't looking good. So just overwhelmed. I didn't know. I was like, how is this my life? Just kind of like how anybody thinks. And also clinging on to the hope that it wasn't cancer. I was Googling everything like sarcoidosis, which is, you know, kind of mimics that. And I was like, anything but cancer, anything but cancer. So yeah, just very overwhelmed. You know, when you get diagnosed, you truly do not know what you're in for. So a lot of what you parrot back is what you've seen in media or you've seen on shows. And I don't know, you didn't know what to expect. And, you know, walking into chemo for the first time, what is chemo other than what I've seen on Scrubs or, you know, whatever other show. And it's crazy how quickly these things become normal. It becomes your life, it becomes reality. But before that, you have literally no concept and so sometimes I do get frustrated when people think that cancer is one way, but also I don't fault them because I feel like I was that person before. And so that's why I've kind of dedicated the rest of my second chance at life to informing people of what cancer really is. So I, so I entered in the ER, they did the chest x-ray, they sent me for a CT scan, saw that they, I had stage two and it was just like in my chest and up. So it wasn't. Um, at that time, we didn't know, but it wasn't in my bone marrow. So I was stage two. Uh, so they did the excisional biopsy. They discharged me the next day. I went to go meet with an oncologist that literally, it was like one that was just walking by in the hospital. Not the one that screamed, I probably have lymphoma. It was another one. <laughs> but uh, so he ended up being my oncologist. I didn't look into anything further. I just figured, okay, that's where, go that's where I'm going to go. You know, and um, I was scheduled to come back in about like three days. And I was just... I wasn't, I wasn't working right at that time. I had gone on leave just temporarily. And I was just every day Googling, scrolling, Googling, scrolling. And then <laughs> this is not, it's not funny, but at the time it was just like, is this really my life? I was over getting some lunch at like a fast food restaurant in between, like, just like Googling, refreshing, scrolling. And all of a sudden on my screen pops up bone marrow biopsy scheduled for tomorrow, PET scan scheduled for tomorrow. And I was like, what is this? What's a bone marrow biopsy? What's a PET scan? And they didn't call me. They didn't call me. And I literally just put down the food, told my husband, we have to leave. I went home. I got on the phone and I said, hi, this is Chelsea Gomez. Um, this appointment just popped up. Do I have cancer? And the person was like, hold, please. And then they put a nurse on the phone. They're like, oh, I miss Gomez. We were going to call you. Um, yes, unfortunately, it came back that you have Hodgkin's. And I was like, so yes, I found out in the middle of a fast food restaurant with nobody even calling me. And I had to call and ask myself. So then they told me, and I just remember it was October 12th, because that's the day I've been diagnosed two years in a row. Um, and I just laid, my daughter was at like a preschool at the time. I just laid on our carpet in the middle of the living room and I just sobbed like the worst sobbing that I've ever sobbed in my life just not knowing anything and I just felt so hopeless and helpless because like I had to call and be like do I have cancer it just wasn't I know there's never a good way or a good time to have that conversation but I feel like there's better ways than that <laughs> that day later when I kind of got off the floor I started seeking people out there like on Instagram who might have had this cancer so I could understand, like, just help me. Because the doctors, I felt like, yeah, they're the oncologists, but they weren't explaining anything to me. They just said, you got cancer, come get chemo, basically. And I'm just like, what? My first oncologist, it was not fate. He had a parade of red flags, I can tell you that, uh, that I didn't see because I didn't know any better. So when I asked questions, he would be very dismissive. He called me Dr. Google, but not in a funny way, in a way like, why are you asking me questions? He uh, gaslit me about um, amounts of treatments that he said, because I would have my family with me all the time. So I, I know that's important. And I knew that as much. Like, I'm not going to be able to focus because I'm so stressed, so overwhelmed. My family would listen, would parrot back to me what was said. But 
you know, my doctor, I had asked about the bone marrow biopsy because that girl who I spoke to told me it was very painful. And so I said, you know, is there a way to do it when I'm under or I wasn't under, but I was sedated for a port placement. So it could have easily been done at the same time and saved me a lot of heartache. And then the oncologist, said, it's really not that big of a deal. Like, honestly, I do them in the office all the time. Like it's, I mean, if you really insist upon it, so very dismissive, very just like, if I do this, I'm stupid. So I said, okay, well, I guess I won't do it. You know, because very much, and also as a woman, you try to say, okay, and shrink down and you're young and you are the patient and this is the doctor and he's been around forever and you don't know anything. I don't know anything about Hodgkin's. So I just shrunk down and I said, okay, well, I, let me just tell you, I left in a wheelchair out of that bone marrow biopsy and I walked in and my mom is traumatized from that. She was with me. She said, you know, Chelsea, I could hear you screaming. And when you came out, you were in a wheelchair. It, it was awful. It was pain. It was the it was worse than childbirth. It honestly was. And now also, let me just side note for anybody ever this watching this. I've talked to people where bone marrow biopsies aren't supposed to be painful like this. There's ways to do them that are not painful. And there are sedation options. And so the fact that it was so painful and that I was made to feel stupid for wanting sedation is not okay. And so my dad was in there with me. And if I could go back, I would have him stand up for me when I didn't have the strength to do it for myself. But also get a second opinion. This, it's not fate that they walk by. It's not, it's, it's, maybe they are the best one for you. But at the same time, this is your health. And that's why like now I'm just telling people like, no, you have to speak up for yourself. I'm like one of those people like very much trust your gut. Something feels wrong. It felt wrong. I didn't trust my gut. And I believe truly that the reason I had to go and get a transplant later on is because I was with this doctor. And you know, also another thing I want to bring up as a woman, he also made it feel like I had no time to preserve fertility. He told me that I had only seven months to live. He literally said seven months. And so he basically made me feel that if I took this extra to three weeks to preserve my fertility, I would be basically giving up being a mother to my existing daughter. Okay, that was in 2018. We're in 2023. I'm still here. I'm still talking to you. But that seven months comment haunts me so much, even though I know that it wasn't true. It still is like a psychological scar in my soul that I feel every day. And sometimes I'm just like seven months, seven months, seven months. And I just don't, I don't feel like that was true. And it's really, that's not something you should say to people unless it's absolutely true. And, you know, my daughter's birthday was uh, on, it's on Halloween. So I got diagnosed on the 12th. Her birthday's on Halloween. I think the week after the 12th, we had a Halloween cruise planned for her. We paid for it like over a year. We had it all set up. He told me I need to cancel it immediately. And like, honestly, I could have gone on that and had one more nice time with my family and been able to do my, you know, preservation of my fertility and everything and still been absolutely fine to start treatment. But he made it seem like if I didn't get in that chair in the next day or two, that was it for me. It's, it's awful because, you know, also when you're a parent of a small child or any age child when you get cancer it's like those moments are taken away from you so a lot of stuff I don't even quite remember of her at that age and so he took that away from me he also took my ability away to have any more children to have those experiences with so basically we started chemo mine was the regimen with bleomycin and that is what I ended up having like an allergic reaction to like four treatments in so I know I did two cycles scan was in December. December showed that the scan wasn't completely clear. It was, it was clear ring, but it wasn't clear. So I had a bulky tumor, but that was never like addressed. Anyway, so we get to this appointment. It's working, but not all the way. And uh, he said basically like, oh, well, you know, it is working, you know, but now looking back, at that point, if your scan isn't completely clear, you should definitely have a conversation about escalating your chemo to a different one that is more severe, but could potentially get rid of the Hodgkins up front. So he never discussed that with me. On the New Year's Eve, I had that chemo. 
I had to go to a different office because the one I was normally at wasn't open. It was only one was open. I left there. I went home. I was like really ill. And I said, I'm just going to go lay in the bed. Like, I, you know, I was always ill after chemo, but I remember my husband waking me up and he's like, are you okay? Like, you don't look okay. And I was like, well, I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not okay. I just had chemo. So he took my temperature. It was like 103 degrees. So he rushed me over to the ER and the ER didn't even like take me in quickly. They put me in finally. They thought I had sepsis. So, which you know, that's very bad. If you have sepsis as a cancer patient who's immunocompromised, they kept saying I had sepsis. And I was like, but how am I just like talking to you if I am like septic? Like I was very coherent and everything. Well, I start Googling because, you know, I'm like Googling, which maybe my nickname Dr. Google is good, but honestly, you should all be Dr. Google because it could tell you a lot. <laughs> so I ended up seeing that bleomycin, sometimes you can have a severe allergic reaction to it. And every symptom I had was that. And so I was like, wait, like, and I started showing, but nobody in that hospital, it wasn't like a big hospital, but they didn't ever knew anything about it. So I was like, call my oncologist, please. It took three days for any oncologist from the practice to come by and see me. And I was just like being traumatized day by day. And they thought it was an infection or sepsis. They realized it wasn't sepsis. They thought it was an infection. They had me on all of these IV antibiotics 24 seven. And I didn't think, I was like, I don't know why I'm on these. I don't, I, I'm telling you like, and there's no tests that are coming back. There's no nothing. And so finally on the fourth day, my oncologist comes by and I'm like, Hey, like, I think this is what it is. Like, this is all my symptoms. Like I don't have anything else. They can't find anything in the cultures. They can't find anything. Can I please get out of the hospital? You know, I want to be discharged. My daughter is like being taken care of by my mom. Her whole life's being disrupted. My husband's with me. And he's like, uh, we're just going to give it a little bit longer. Not explaining anything. It felt like I was in prison. And then when I ended up seeing my oncologist after that, he's like, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure that was a bleomycin allergy and we're going to take you off of bleomycin, but we really need to get your treatment going because it's been delayed enough. But he said, you know, because bleomycin is very toxic chemo and it can cause lung damage and I already have asthma. So he had me go for a pulmonary function test after he determined that I was correct, that it was a allergic reaction. And my pulmonary function had dropped like 30 points. And so, I mean, thankfully it has improved with time now, but that was so scary. He's like, I really don't want to remove it because, you know, we really need to get you back into remission. And, you know, if I didn't think that you'd end up in the ICU, I would just keep you on it. But I was like, and I told, I said, okay, but I'm never taking that again. Like I was in the ICU for three days. So I ended up, fin I did 12 total treatments. So six cycles. So I think three were with, three or four were with the full ABVD. I think it was four, um, four treatment. No, it must've been five treatments total. And then on the sixth one, they took me off of it or something. And so I ended up finishing ABD. It was pretty, you know, very, it was fine, you know, as chemo could be. I rang the bell. I had like a unicorn onesie on, a purple wig, like, yeah, let's go be behind me. Yeah, great, you know. Um, had a follow-up scan, I think a month post-chemo to like let everything settle down. And on my scan, there was still things lighting up. And he said, you know, oh, I think that's just residual, you know, swelling or disease, like not residual, like active disease, but you know, there could be necrotic things there. So I was like, okay, like I just, I didn't want to be a cancer patient anymore. I wanted to be healthy, go on with my life. And so I believed, although I always had this thing in my head that was like, is it like a little sus? Like, you know, what I, mean? I was like, okay. So, uh, yeah, he just basically said, see ya in three months. And then I had another scan, which is where it showed that it was growing. And live for yourself. Like, truly, life is too freaking short. Like, there's no other way to put it. Make yourself happy. Focus on your family. Do what you always wanted to do.